Well, for the sake of time, you know, we'll offer Dr. Al Saadi 20 minutes only, as he promised. As you know, Dr. Al Saadi is well known for his, he's uh, the current president of the Emirati League against epilepsy. He worked as the chief of the neurology service at Sheikh Khalifa Medical Center until he uh, started, you know, being the CMO for the American Center of uh, Psychiatry and Neurology. Dr. Uh, Al Saadi will talk about his uh, talk is by the title of Five Common Myths in Idiopathic Generalized Epilepsy. So go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kalani. I realize I have a very difficult task ahead of me. I know I gave uh, Dr. Hamad Harb a difficult task, but my task is even harder. I'm the last speaker of the event. Plus I had prepared my talk based on my, uh, my understanding. It's a 30 minutes talk, but now I've just learned it's 15 minutes. So I'll see what I can do. It's a really difficult one. So what I will be covering in the coming uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, this is my disclosure, uh, the epidemiology of idiopathic generalized epilepsy, some of the common myths, as well as some of the treatment options. We know that idiopathic generalized epilepsy is a group or a spectrum of disorders with variable age of presentation, onset typically in early life, but we have some case reports of uh, later onset uh, generalized epilepsy. Most often they do respond to appropriate treatment and about half of these patients may outgrow their seizures. So it's, as you can see here, it's a basically a spectrum of disorders with a variable age of presentation. Most often these patients have normal IQ, uh, specific uh, EEG features, and they again, uh, they do respond to the appropriate treatment. Thank this you. is based on a recent, I don't know why, we can, why is that not synchronized? Okay, now it's synchronized, sorry, I didn't know that. This is based on the recent International League Against Epilepsy Task Force on Nosology, which will be published very soon, basically summarizing the recent classifications of epilepsies. So genetic generalized epilepsy, we have idiopathic generalized epilepsy as well as epileptic encephalopathy. And under idiopathic generalized epilepsy, we find the specific epilepsy syndrome, again, summarizing this spectrum of disorders. The prevalence varies from children to adults, but roughly about 40, 50% would have generalized epilepsies. If you look at the, some of the studies on this, you can easily appreciate that the rates of idiopathic generalized epilepsy can be as little as 5% as high as about 15% in some other studies in some other countries. So the first myth that IG has a low economic burden. Well, based on a study by uh, Patrick Kwan, based on a survey that was uh, nationwide as well as across several countries, including US, Canada, Europe, as well as Brazil, and looking at specific measures, including quality of life, as well as healthcare ut utilization, it turns out that patients who had more than one seizure per month had obviously worse health quality of life, as well as health worth, worth uh, 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 health utility scores, as well as more direct and indirect costs as compared to patients who had less than one seizure per year. So definitely it's a costly disease. Second myth that IG is associated with low morbidity and mortality. Well, we know that GTCs or generalized tonic-clonic seizures risk for severe injuries. And in this retrospective study that included 28,000 seizures with uh, 264 adults having a generalized tonic-clonic seizure was a risk for a severe injury that put these patients at risk of almost three times more. And these patients, as a result of the GTC, are at 10 times more risk of having minor injuries. In addition to that, we just heard a talk on SUDEB. It turns out that based on the pool data, that having GTC, especially for those who have GTC more than three times per year, these patients are at 15 times higher risk of sudden death of epilepsy because of th that uh, frequent GTCs. IgE begin in uh, childhood. Yes, it does for most of the time, but there are several case reports summarized in these reports that we have an adult onset IgE. And this is a, based on a midline search of all the cases of late onset idiopathic generalized epilepsies. There were nine patients had been identified, female predominant, families of epilepsy in about two thirds of these patients, and all of them had generalized tonic-clonic seizure presentations. This is an example of patients I've seen in practice who had new onset GTC at the age of 85, turned out to become a non-convulsive status, started on treatment, then responded to treatment. As you can see, the EEG pattern having a, a typical pattern of uh, generalized spike and slow wave complexes. 
Again, it's not uncommon. You can still experience GTC at a late onset, uh, later age, on, if you like, but you have to think about it. IgE has no focal semiology or E discharges. Well, we know that frequent focal features had been reported in patients with confirmed diagnosis of idiopathic generalized epilepsy, including versive or cyclic seizures. Focal seizures uh, symptoms had been reported in half of these patients. Auras that we know is typical for patients with partial onset epilepsy had been also reported in two thirds of patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsies. EEG features, we know that the typical generalized spike and slow wave complexes, but we have also seen uh, focal features in at least half of the patients with, uh, with a confirmed diagnosis with idiopathic generalized epilepsy. In one of the studies that have looked at this, including 180 patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy, initial EEG was normal about half of these patients and 21% showed persistent normal EEG despite several years of follow-up. So normal EEGs can also be seen in patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy. Quickly, this, you have to know about this phenomenon of generalized polyspike train because that could be a marker for difficult to control generalized epilepsy uh, syndrome. So this is based on study by uh, Biroka and others in, in Australia, looking at patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy. They looked at cohort with patient with drug responsive versus not drug responsive idiopathic generalized epilepsy and looked at several variables that can dictate if patients are responsive versus not responsive. Obviously having more frequent GTCs can be a predictor for patients not responding to treatment. As you can see here, having more than three seizures per year as compared to one seizure per year, two versus one. So having more frequent GTCs is a predictor if patients are responsive or not. But more importantly, if they have the strain of polyspikes uh, generalized strain. This is what we typically see in patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy. We can see focal discharges on a symmetry that can be, uh, ace, uh, onset can be asymmetric, or there may some, uh, some be, uh, there can be some, also some amplitude symmetry in patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy with again confirmed with uh, EEG features. The generalized uh, polyspike train, especially for those that happen at nighttime, can be a quite a predictor. This is a pattern of generalized polyspike train, especially if you see it at nighttime, that is a predictor of patient not responding to treatment. Now, what about the myth that IgE do respond to treatment most often? Well, actually it does, but if you choose the right treatment. This is based on a follow-up study that suggests to us that two thirds of patients with confirmed diagnosis with idiopathic generalized epilepsy only respond to treatment. And with continuous follow-up, some uh, fewer percentage would respond to incremental, incrementally to future trials of uh, other AEDs. So not all patients would respond to treatment with confirmed diagnosis with idiopathic generalized epilepsy. And indeed, there are some drugs that we consider them broad spectrum, meaning they can work for all seizure types, including obviously those with idiopathic generalized epilepsy. So this is here. There are also a list of drugs that you definitely need to avoid because they could exacerbate some uh, seizure types in patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy, including carb, oxcarb, and other medications. This is a list of medications that you, def you probably need to avoid in patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy. Selim Bembadis looked at the phenomenon of pseudo-intractable epilepsy in patients with confirmed diagnosis of epilepsy. They were treated with wrong uh, AADs. Obviously, they did not respond to treatment, so they were pseudo-intractable because they were not using the appropriate anti-epileptic medication. And when they were switched to the right drug, they became responsive. We have implicated, we replicated that same study in UAE. We came up with the same conclusion. There's a concept of pseudo-intractable drug uh, for patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy if you're using the wrong drug for this underlying epilepsy syndrome. So what we know that 80% of patients would respond to valproic acid, but what is the data on VPA being the drug of choice in patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy? Well, if you look at the FDA label, actually it doesn't say anything that the, that the uh, VPA is a drug of choice in patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy. It only works for patients with complex partial seizures with or without secondary generalization. There's nothing mentioned about IgE at all. And if you look at the, the according to International League Epilepsy classification of evidence, as you can see that VPA has a level C evidence of its effectiveness in patients with generalized tonic-clonic seizures in adults. And in patients with only with absence seizures have a level A evidence, but there's no evidence whatsoever in patients with, uh, uh, with generalized tonic-clonic seizures in adults. And actually that's had called, there's no more need 
to have a better drugs for patients with idiopathic jaundice epilepsy. As you can see from the Tracy Clauser statement, there's an especially alarming lack of well-designed, properly conducted randomized controlled trials in patients with seizure or epilepsies and for children in general. And as a matter of fact, if you look at some of the data of valproic acid in patients with idiopathic jaundice epilepsy, most of them are open label. This is one of the data by Borgovich, where they basically suggested that the, effects, the efficacy of VPA in terms of seizure free rate is in the range of 70, 80% across all seizure types in patients with idiopathic jaundice epilepsy. Another comparative study comparing valproic acid to phenytoin in patients with uh, diagnosed with generalized epilepsies follow up for three years, again, in favor of uh, valproic acid as compared to phenytoin. Another study at 136 patients with diagnosed with primary generalized epilepsy, only 50% uh, of them were confirmed with EEG features. And we again, suggesting that the rates of seizure free rates in, in the range of 65 or 60% or so. However, we all keep in mind that VPA comes with an expense of severe cosmetic side effects, including acne, weight gain, hirsutism, especially for women, cognitive outcome in, in babies born to mothers taking valproic acid. This is based on Kim Meder, suggesting obviously worse cognitive outcome in babies born to mother taking valproic acid. This is the three-year outcome data. And if you look at the five years outcome data, same thing, higher, uh, cognitive, uh, worsen cognitive scores in babies born to mother taking valproic acid. This is based, based on Northern American drug registry. Again, you can find the culprit, higher congenital malformations in babies born to mother taking valproic acid as compared to other AEDs. Several drug registries, including studies from Sweden, UK, and others, suggesting again that the main culprit is valproic acid with a higher rates of congenital malformation. This is our study in UAE, suggesting again that valproic acid is the main culprit with a higher rates of congenital malformation as compared to other AEDs. But it turns out that the, the rates of congenital malformation is dose dependent, meaning the higher the dose, the more likely you would encounter this increased risk of congenital malformation. And that is based on several drug registry studies, including the studies in UK, US, and others, including the studies in Europe. Now, recently in uh, Danimark, suggesting increased rate of uh, attention spectrum disorders in babies to, born to mothers taking valproic acid, something to keep in mind if, you, if your patient is willing to take an, an pregnancy while taking valproic acid. Now, what about lamotrigine? Lamotrigine can be an option, obviously, but there are high rate, several case reports suggesting increased risk of worsening myoclonic jerks in patients taking lamotrigine. This is the data by uh, uh, Chip Morris. Other data as well, suggesting several case reports of worsening myoclonic jerks in patients who are taking lamotrigine. Now, how does lamotrigine compare to valproic acid? This is based on the data by uh, Quan and Brody. Uh, we're openly comparing valproic acid to lamotrigine. Again, you see a higher responder rates, higher seizure-free rates in patients who are taking VPA as compared to patients who are taking lamotrigine. Now, another data from Poland suggesting the same thing, higher rates of seizure-free rates in patients who are taking valproic acid as compared to patients who are taking uh, lamotrigine in both patients with idiopathic jaundice epilepsy as well as for those with confirmed diagnosis with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. Now, what about tuparamate? This is based on initial uh, pivotal trials by Arroyo and others who looked at the tuparamate in randomized controlled trials in patients with epilepsy. Obviously, half of these patients had met the criteria for idiopathic generalized epilepsy where patients were randomized to either higher dose of tuparamate or lower dose of tuparamate of 50 milligram. And this is based on a class one evidence uh, included, as I said, half of these patients had met the criteria for IgE. And as you can see here, higher rates of seizure-free rates in patients who are randomized to the higher rates of a higher uh, dosage of tuparamate as compared to patients who are randomized to the smaller dose of tuparamate. Now, how we can compare retrospectively or openly the various AEDs in patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy, this data by Nicholson, we're suggesting again that valproic acid is still, unfortunately, the drug of her choice in these patients. This is based on 1,000 patients with uh, breakdown of several epilepsy syndrome. And as you can see here, obviously the valproic acid is still the drug of first choice as compared to other medications. But what, more importantly, what happens if patient had failed valproic acid? Well, if patient had failed valproic acid because of 
poor tolerability or because of side effects, there's at least 12 to 15% chance that patient may respond to Lamotogy. Whereas if your patient had failed valproic acid because of lack of efficacy, none would respond to lamotogene. A smaller percentage may, may respond to the combination of lamotogene and valproic acid. We've heard the, the SANA trials with the first randomized uh, trial that looked at one of the arms had patients with generalized epilepsies, where patients randomized to leptoparamate, lamotogene, or valproic acid. As you can see here, that two-thirds of the cohorts had met the criteria for idiopathic generalized epilepsy, another third had had unclassified epilepsy and that for these patients had obviously randomized to the broad spectrum AEDs. And based on the trial, again, you can find that valproic acid is superior to either two arms of the treatment, including topotamate and lamotogene. And uh, lamotogene is the most inferior as compared to valproic acid and topotamate, whereas topotamate was intermediate, but topotamate was worsened as compared to the other two arms of treatment in terms of tolerability. So again, suggesting overall that valproic acid is the first drug of choice in patients with idiopathic jaws epilepsy, but they have caution about the using valproic acid in women with childbearing age. Now, what about levetiracetam, broad spectrum AEDs with a proven efficacy in patients with JME, as well as those with idiopathic jaws epilepsy? This is the data by Berkovich as an add-on trial for patients who randomized based on double-binded control trials who had failed several AEDs at baseline, randomized to placebo or to levetiracetam. And again, you can see here that included 140 patients with a severe breakdown of several epilepsy syndromes, including JME, as well as those with idiopathic generalized epilepsy. Half of these patients had been taking valproic acid, meaning had failed valproic acid. And you can see that across all the treatment arms that uh, levetiracetam was superior to placebo across the treatment, all the treatment arms. Uh, and the cohorts of patients with idiopathic jaws, epilepsy, who had failed several baseline anti-epileptic drugs. In terms of seizure-free rate, again, much in favor of levetiracetam as compared to uh, placebo. So overall, levetiracetam is effective, well-tolerated, and safe medication for patients with idiopathic jaws, epilepsy as an add-on treatment. Now, the pirapinil is a last kid on the block that had been uh, approved for indication of idiopathic jaws, epilepsy based on the data by Jackie French, with a class one evidence suggesting that Brampanel is a good drug of efficacy in patients who had failed several anti-epileptic drugs. The data by Jackie French had included patients with confirmed diagnosis with idiopathic jaws epilepsy had failed several anti-epileptic medication as baseline. And they, uh, based on a double-binded placebo control trials, the incremental response of two milligram every, two, every week up to eight milligram as compared to the uh, placebo so arm. If you, if you have two minutes. <laughs> yeah, five minutes. I'll, I'll do it in five minutes. So half of these patients had met the criteria of idiopathic generalized epilepsy. And as you can see, this is a breakdown of their patients. And again, the data is in favor of uh, parampinil as compared to the placebo in terms of reduction in seizure frequency, responder rates much in favor of parampinil. This is our data in UAE, suggesting the efficacy of parampinil in patients with uh, idiopathic generalized epilepsy who had failed several anti-epileptic drugs. The data by Vilanova had also suggested that pirampinol is a good option in patients who had failed several drugs, including appropriate ones for idiopathic generalized epilepsy. This is the data that we had presented at the AES last year based on a multi uh, uh, international studies, including some collaborators in the States and uh, Europe, as well as in Taiwan, uh, suggesting a higher efficacy rate in patients who are started on parampinil as compared to uh, other medications, including higher responder rates and higher seizure-free rates. This is the work that we had published in the AES and will be presented again to the American Academy of Neurology based on uh, multinational international studies that looked at patients who had randomized or who had started on parampinil as an add-on treatment and comparing the seizure-free rates in patients who are started on parampinil as compared to other medications. We have learned higher seizure-free rates in patients on parampinil in patients with, with generalized epilepsies as compared to patients with partial epilepsy, where you can see that the retention rate had almost reached 70% at, uh, up, to six, uh, up to several years of follow-up. This based on ex expert opinion, as you can see that valproate as a still drug of first choice, but other alternatives can be considered in patients who had failed valproic acid. Just to leave you with the, what we know so far about AEDs, there are drugs that are broad spectrum, meaning they work for both partial as well as generalized epilepsy, including valproic acid, 
lamotrigine to parmate, tonic gland, parapenem, and probably uh, lamotrigine. We'll leave you with a final thought that uh, uncontrolled idiopathic generalized epilepsy has substantial economic burden. IgE can develop in adults and even at a later age. Focal asymmetrical semiology as well as EEG changes can be seen in patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy. Generalized polyspike train may be a marker for uh, patients not responding to treatment. And 30% of patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy can be drug resistant. And obviously you have to be aware of seizure activation by using the wrong uh, advice AEDs in patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy, specifically when you try sodium channel blocker. With that, I end and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Tawfiq, for being Ms. Kul Khitam and for keeping on time. May I ask uh, Professor Hart to be with us, please, on the stage? Uh, I, think, um, I think our speaker from abroad still to them, uh, Professor Garaner and uh, Professor Bokbil, is still with us. And uh, thank you, the attendees, for bearing with us until this late. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the session is open now for short questions, please. I have a question for Dr. Tawfiq. Dr. Tawfiq, uh, uh, if we have a patient with a JME and it's very difficult to treat, not responding to levetiracetam, and uh, can we use uh, lamotrigine in those patients? Uh, although lamotrigine can exacerbate, but, but she's, uh, she's planning, she's married and she's planning seriously for uh, to get pregnant. So uh, it's a very difficult scenario where, where the patient is really not responding at all uh, to levitracetam. So what is next after this? Well, in the patient, obviously, you talk about women with childbearing age or contemplating pregnancy. I think this is a question. Obviously, what we do in a case like this, you can, and the patient not responding to levitracetam, you can add a small dose of valparic acid. Because as I said, I would say, unfortunately, vaporic acid is still the drug of first choice in patients with idiopathic genital epilepsy. And as you know, that the rates of congenital malformation in the case of VPA is dose dependent. So obviously, the, the lower the dose, the lower the risk. So a small dose of vaporic acid com and com combined with, uh, with uh, libertacetam could be the best way moving. She's not pregnant. Well, even if she's contemplating pregnancy, as I said, small dose of vaporic acid to, to, to better to control. Lam well, the data on lamotrigine is quite mixed, but but we know so far that lamotrigine could worsen the myoclonic jerk. So, if in the patient with idiopathic generalized epilepsy, especially with those with JME who have a strong myoclonic jerks, I probably would avoid lamotrigine. And in and, and these cases, again, I would be, personally, I would probably would choose to add a small dose of vaporic acid because I know lamotrigine would not uh, cut it in this patient. Amide and other drugs, well. Ethosuximide only work for absence seizures. It doesn't work for amide, uh, lacosamide. Lacos well, uh, there's data on lacosamide, obviously, in patients with idiopathic generalized epilepsy based on recent uh, data that was published recently, but the, the data uh, in terms of its safety in pregnancy is unknown. And as a matter of fact, there's some, uh, some reports suggesting a higher risk of congenital malformations. I probably would avoid it because we don't know yet. There's a question from Dr. Abubakar. Yeah. Yes, uh, I have a question to Dr. Graner. Uh, you mentioned in your notes or your uh, talks that 2% of people may develop asystole. Would you work them up for cardiac cause or you just assume or conclude that that could be from the seizure itself? Yeah, so um, uh, the question is uh, in patients that are having ictal asystole with a seizure? Yes. Yeah, yeah I think in, in general, um, we would work them up for underlying cardiac cause too. They may have a, a channel disorder or a prolonged QT syndrome. So at minimum, I think a EKG would be um, uh, good in that case. And um, Sometimes we collaborate with cardiology too on those cases. And um, if the patient is refractory and, and we're not confident that we can completely control seizures, the patient may also benefit from a pacemaker to uh, at least main, maintain the cardiac uh, rates in the occurrence of a seizure. Thank you. Uh, 
I think there's a question from Dr. Naik. Uh, Dr. Tofik Mohammed, thanks for the uh, very detailed but fast talk. Uh, I have one, one observation and one question. Observation is that uh, when you have idiopathic epilepsy, I found most of the patients who are treated with carbamazepine, phenytoin, all, all those who are not supposed to be used and they aggravate and they send the patient to you with two or three medication. The question is, if you have repeated EEG showing a focal discharge from a same leads, would you investigate them further with a PET scan or, or send them to an epileptic sensor where there may be a focus which we are, or you, you call them cryptogenic, that you don't have the, the method to diagnose them? Thank you. Obviously, if they are intractable, yes, they should be referred to epilepsy uh, surgery programs or epilepsy programs for further evaluation. But you have to keep in mind that focal features had been reported in patients with confirmed diagnosis with idiopathic general epilepsy. But they have persistent uh, focal features on their AEGs, obviously, especially of those who are refractive, meaning you're not responding to several appropriate AEDs, I would definitely would consider them for a referral for epilepsy uh, uh, unit for further evaluation, absolutely. Dr. Tofik, thank you very much. As Dr. Naik said, you, you were very quick. We could not digest all what you said, full of information. Uh, in, the, in those who are resistant to a series of epileptics, uh, is there a one for uh, clonazepam or clobazepam? I'm not a believer of clonazepam being an, an anti-seizure medication. But you are now stuck. I, I personally would not use clonazepam because we know that patients on clonazepam, they, they would develop uh, tolerance to the effect of clonazepam. You may see some good response early on, but later on, uh, I don't think it's a good choice. And um, since I have Dr. Basil with us here, I'd like to hear your thoughts on clonazepam as a choice in patients with idiopathic genesis epilepsy. So I'll, I'll, I'll refer it back to you, uh, Basil. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I would avoid it. Uh, on the other hand, I would I would consider clobazam. Uh, you know, we 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 have, we have seen. I mean, we did a small study here. We we saw a good percentage of patients who became seizure free with uh, addition of clobazam. Well, certain clobazam is a better choice than clonazepam, and I would only use it or revert to it if patient had not respond responded to other appropriate uh, AEDs. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Professor Brenner. You mentioned the role of genetics uh, in the pathogenesis of SUDEP. And do you consider screening uh, by whole genome sequencing in future for epileptic patients to determine or predict the onset of seizures, uh, status epilepticus with uh, SUDEP or like QT interval, prolonged QT interval or other genealopathies are genetically inherited. So do you consider yeah. the screening will help to predict and the risk of SUDEP in such patient, uh, patients? I, I think that will eventually be an important tool. I'm not sure we're quite there yet. Um, I would definitely look for a QT prolongation on the EKG. Uh, and in patients that have that, they may warrant further um, cardiology evaluation and, and perhaps genetic testing. I have to admit, I'm not a, uh, as attuned to the cardiac mechanisms of SUDEP as I am to the respiratory mechanisms. And it's, it's probably the case, this would be my bias, is that uh, cardiac mechanisms, especially underlying genetic cardiac mechanisms, probably account for a very small minority of SUDEP cases, whereas the majority appear to be uh, it appears to be sufficient to have had a convulsion in bed with your face in the pillow, not waking up and not breathing properly, even if your heart is normal. Uh, so I think there's a lot yet to be learned about uh, underlying uh, cardiac um, risk factors and, and uh, genetics. Uh, at our center, we're not uh, currently screening for those, but I think in the future, we probably will be. No more questions? So uh, if no more questions, I would like to thank the speakers from abroad, Dr. Uh, Eric, Dr. Graner, Dr. Uh, Abu Khalil, Dr. Mohammed Harb as well here, and my co-chairs. And uh, yeah. thank you for staying till late. Enjoy the evening. Thank you.